Joel Sloan, and I'm a neuroradiologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I regret that I can't be there with you in person, but I want to acknowledge Sri Ashmoha, one of my colleagues and mentors, who has been on my behalf. And I'm thrilled to talk to you today about unraveling the mysteries of MR imaging epilepsy. I was given the title for my talk, so I, I can't take credit for it, but I love the idea of unraveling the mystery of MRI and the mystery of epilepsy using MRI. I found a very appropriate illustration on the right that evokes our process as we pull on the threads, tease apart, and untangle the structure and function of the brain through vision to find that knot, that lesion that can cause the seizures. And I really do approach every epilepsy case with that sense of wonder. What am I going to find? Yeah. But not only that, also a sense of passion and purpose. Finding a structural brain lesion can be a life changing and potentially life saving event for epilepsy patients. These lesions are missed over and over. Many don't change over time. And this is your chance as an imager to really make a big difference in someone's life. Now, unraveling can also be falling apart. So I wanted to try to give some structure and context to our approach and what we were looking for in epilepsy MRI. I'm going to be talking mostly about adult epilepsy, which is what I do. And most of what I'm going to say is covered in this free review article we wrote a few years ago with the graphics. First, a few disclosures, none of which are very relevant to the current talk. I want to start with definitions of seizures and epilepsy. Seizure describes abnormal excessive or synchronous electrical activity in the brain with the result in transient occurrence of neurologic signs and symptoms. Epilepsy is a chronic disease of spontaneous and recurrent seizures. A practical diagnosis from the International League Against Epilepsy uh, is that these two unprovoked seizures created 24 hours apart, one unprovoked seizure at high likelihood of recurrence or diagnosis with an epilepsy-associated syndrome. In terms of demographics, epilepsy is the fourth most common neurological problem, affects at least 3 million people in the United States as of 2015 and estimated <coughs> more than 65 million worldwide. The incidence is highest in children and in elderly, uh, many patients are responsive to medications, but many are not, as we'll talk about. Uh, and there are associated really significant psychosocial issues, potential cognitive impairment, uh, patients who are unable to drive, costs associated with care. And there's a significant impact on life expectancy from trauma, uh, from also from sudden the, the phenomenon of sudden unexplained death and epilepsy. So it is a really serious disease with wide ranging impact. I just want to make everyone aware of now not so recent update in epilepsy terminology and seizure classification, which reflects where seizures begin, uh, the level of awareness during seizures, and other associated feature, features of, uh, of semiology. Um, what we used to call partial seizures are called focal, arising in one region of the brain, and may have preserved or impaired awareness and other features. Focal seizures can spread to involve both hemispheres, so focal to bilateral. Alternatively, seizures can be generalized to onset, involving both hemispheres simultaneously, or of unknown or unclassified onset. If we look at our epilepsy cases in our practice, uh, and uh, this slide is adapted from Kate Davis, my close colleague and medical director of the Epilepsy Center at Penn, about two-thirds of patients are controlled on anti-epileptic medications, but one third are drug resistant. Among drug-resistant cases, the majority are focal, about two-thirds of these are temporal, most of these are temporal sclerosis, and one-third are neocortical or extra-temporal, again, about one, uh, about two-thirds of the regional. You can kind of remember this as a two-thirds rule in these certain categories. But the point is, our critical job as neuroradiologists is to find lesions in this in these drug-resistant focal epilepsy cases. And that is because focal epilepsy patients with identified lesions have a much higher chance of seizure freedom. Surgery may involve focal resection of the lesion or anterior temporal lobectomy or more selective manipulative hippocampectomy in the case of mesocumbral sclerosis. Uh, there are some older surgical options, some of which may be used in pediatric practice. And in recent years, we have seen less invasive laser ablation therapy. Um, either for mesotemporal temporal sclerosis or other vocal lesions. And there are a growing number of neuromodulatory approaches with devices such as vagal nerve stimulation, responsive neurostimulation with uh, intracranial cerebral electrodes, and deep brain stimulation targeting planet nuclei, particularly the anterior and central median nuclei. 
Surgical planning for focal epilepsy is a multidisciplinary process that first involves scalp EEG in conjunction with video monitoring and maybe ginger pain EEG for better localization. Uh, what my colleague Kate Davis again has called the most invasive diagnostic test in medicine. Planning involves neuropsychological evaluation. MRI, of course, is crucial. The point of this talk, for structural imaging, we prefer a pre Tesla over 1.5 and do also use 7T MRI. We do functional MRI for language lateralization, which is largely replaced water testing. We do nuclear medicine studies, primarily FDG PET, looking for areas of hypometabolism. We also do SPECT, although it's less practical. And we do have a magnetoencephalography or MEG device at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that can localize epileptic spikes and also complements functional MRI. In terms of MRI sequences, again, we, we prefer three Tesla to 1.5. We include 3D T1 weighted and either 3D or axial and coronal flare, along with coronal T2 weighted and phase sensitive inversion recovery T1 weighted images through the temporal lobes. We will get diffusion weighted or diffusion tensor imaging, axial T2 weighted and susceptibility weighted imaging. We typically don't get contrast enhanced imaging in our patient population, but this may depend on your geographic area and we test probabilities. What are we looking for? In terms of focal etiologies, primarily mesial temporal sclerosis, but also abnormalities of breakout proliferation, migration, and organization, near cutaneous syndromes, neoplasms, classic often temporal lobe neoplasm associated with seizures, organic glioma, DNET, and DXA, also uh, hypoplanic hematoma, typically cortically infiltrative, uh, all of the dendrogliomas are certainly associated with seizures. Um, it's also important to recognize, for example, that seizures are quite common with, with uh, glioblastoma, and epilepsy can also be a perioblastic phenomenon. Finally, vascular and traumatic causes are quite common, and infection and vesicolia of infection, uh, this represents an important cause, especially worldwide, but I will say it's less common in our practice at Penn. Uh, here is a wonderful illustration from the Radiology Assistant website with all of these focal lesions in one particularly unfortunate individual. I'm going to spend the rest of my talk on the following lesions, which I'm most preoccupied with finding, and I commonly missed uh, the needles in the, in the haystack, as it were, with this drawing from the same illustrator as the title slide. Mesial temporal sclerosis is the most common lesion associated with intracranial temporal epilepsy. The etiology is a little controversial and not exactly understood, but certainly the medial limbic circuit is very susceptible to seizures and damage from current seizures. And the typical imaging findings are shown in this illustration. Uh, hippocampal atrophy, T2 flare bright signal loss of architecture, um, uh, associated relative enlargement of the temporal horn. I'm going to show you here the same thing on that on actual image. So again, uh, mesial temporal uh, sclerosis on the right with loss of volume, signal abnormality, relative prominence of the temporal horn. You may have ipsilateral hornets or mammary body atrophy. Uh, Due to that medial limbic circuit, you may see ipsilateral temporal pole gray white blurring. Uh, no, uh, you can have another lesion with secondary MTS, so dual pathology. I note also that it can be bilateral in about 10 to 20 percent of patients. Notably, these patients typically have good outcomes with surgery or laser ablation. In addition to atrophy, hyperintensity, and loss of internal architecture, I want to draw your attention to surface features of the hippocampus. So undulations along the hippocampal surface have been called digitations at the hippocampal head and dentations along the undersurface of the body and tail. But really, it's the same corrugation if you look in three dimensions that's on the bottom, uh, bottom image on the right. Now, absent digitations, as you see at the top left, at the hippocampal head is a reliable sign of MTS even at 1.5 T. Uh, when you look at 3T and 7T, as in uh, some of these examples, bottom left and on the right, uh, these, uh, you can see these surface undulations even better. This has two consequences. First, we should appreciate loss of digitations and dentations in MTS. For example, this is a case from a review paper we wrote with um, right side of MTS and 7 Tesla. You see the normal digitations and dentations on the left with the arrowheads and the normal inter internal architecture of the hippocampal uh, dark band indicated by an arrow. But we lose these features on the affected side on the right. And look how smooth the hippocampus looks on the coronal and sagittal views 
So our tip, I always look for these features, especially on high resolution 3D, 2 one images, um, not only in the coronal plane, but especially in the sagittal plane. But know that the hippocampal dentations can also cause partial volume artifact on coronal images. Here on the top row of three tests, so we see apparent loss of that normal hippocampal dark band signal uh, indicated by the arrow on the two millimeter thick coronal T2 wave image. But look at the dentations along the hippocampal body of the sagittal 3D21 in panel B. At 70, we, uh, the thin sections, we see the dark band is normal, but can be obscured on frontal slices through the region of surface undulations. I just want to reference for USAS the technique to measure glutamate levels with higher sensitivity and resolution than conventional spectroscopy that we are investigating for epilepsy imaging. We have found that you can lateralize non lesional temporal of epilepsy based on lower glutamate levels with USAS and hippocampus. And we've also published on better characterizing epileptogenic tumors with elevated glutamate levels um, uh, using USAS. Focal cortical dysplasia is probably the most common cause of epilepsy when we can't find lesions despite our best efforts. Features are cortical thickening and great white blurring. Um, but this uh, and abnormal gyral patterning or deeper, deeper salt, this can be very subtle in many of our cult. The transmantle sign uh, is a very specific feature that you should always look for. That is a wedge shaped or linear signal extending from the, from the cortex to the ventricular margin. Importantly, these patients also have the outcomes when the lesions are resectable. In our search for FCDs, I want to point to a few exciting developments. One is the EDGE sequence from Eric Middlebrooks and his colleagues at Mayo Clinic in Florida. EDGE uses an inversion pulse time to null voxels that contain both gray and white matter, so it gives you this very nice etching artifact of the gray white interface, as you see in um, MA. Now, MP2 rage is a sequence that we typically get uh, for high resolution imaging at uh, T1 weighted imaging at 70 because of uh, correction of signaling homogeneity. Uh, and it uses two inversion pulses. And what they've done actually is incorporated the edge uh, part as the first of the two inversion pulses so that we can also get this sequence in about the same amount of time. And here's an example of a left frontal FCD. Visualize, visualize a thickening of that etching artifact again in panel A, uh, probably more conspicuous than the subtle thickening seen on the flare in panel B and not well seen on T1. Apparently, this also corresponded to spiking by MEG, and the patient went on to have an ablation as seen in panel F. MELD is a project uh, led by Sophie uh, and Conrad Adler Boxtel at the University, uh, University College London that has developed a surface-based pipeline for predicting SCDs from high resolution to unweighted uh, and if available flare data. There are other such tools, but I like this one based on their approach of collecting, labeling, and harmonizing a ton of data from multiple international sites and sharing their pipeline in open source format on GitHub. I'm excited to see how well these and other machine learning and deep learning approaches will, will perform. Moving on, you'd be surprised how easily polymeric gyrant can be missed. Uh, this is a malformation of cortical development, which, with, as the name implies, too many and too small gyri. It's often very sylvian, and as a result, I think it's often best appreciated uh, in the sagittal plane of uh, high resolution 3D2 on moving engine, as you see here. It may be bilateral, it often lines the class seen in schizencephaly. Uh, and can be associated with underlying areas of periventricular modular paratopia. Here's an interesting case we discussed actually in our epilepsy surgical conference this week. A young man who suffered a very severe traumatic brain injury in a car crash. He had frontal skull and ventral skull base fractures and multiple compartmental intracranial hemorrhage. He now has extensive bifrontal uh, encephalomalacia, actually has a meninges yield at the plane of sphenoidal, and a small area of contracula occipital encephalomalacia. But look at this, he also has uh, polymicrogyria along the left superior frontal sulcus that may be the true source of the seizures. Now, he was the driver um, of the car, but apparently the car accident was actually caused by another motorist. Uh, Gray ventricular nodular heterotopia describes abnormal gray matter winding the ventricles, which may be unilateral or bilateral, typically found along the atria and temporal and occipital horns, as we see here. 
Of course, some of the pendulum nodules can be, uh, can be seen with tuberous sclerosis along with tubers. Now, note that the clotting tail, of course, is along the temporal porch, so it should not be mistaken for heterotopia. Finally, I want to talk about temporal lobe and cephalic seals. These are herniations of brain tissue through the sphenoid wings along the floor of the middle cranial fossa and may end injury, uh, which may be acquired traumatic uh, genital. But I would say in our practice, there is an epidemic of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which I think is, uh, is fascinating, actually. It's podium manifestations of headaches, vision changes. You can have muscle palpitinitis, uh, cranial neuropathies, and you can have epilepsy. And particularly for a patient that fits uh, that uh, clinical pattern, uh, a middle-aged woman or man with adult onset epilepsy and obesity, you really have to think about this diagnosis and look for partially empty cell and sphenoid wing remodeling. Now, there's a great description of two types of lateral sphenoid cephalocele from AJNR in 2014. That depends on whether there's a pneumatized lateral sphenoid recess. If there is, as in type one. Um, that a cephalocele can permeate into the recess and cause a CSF leak with intracranial hypotension and present with headache and myelopia. In type 2, with a pneumatized recess, there's uh, nowhere for the cephalocele to go and it remains intradipoic, but can still develop gliosis and irritation and present with seizures. In practice, I carefully scrutinized high resolution T1 and T2 weighted images and CT looking for this, and it can be tricky because, again, Idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudo tumor is pretty common, and you can see skull based remodeling with prominent arachnoid granulations or arachnoid pits in asymptomatic patients. Sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish prominent arachnoid granulations from cephalocele or a combination. There's, a, there's your uh, cephalocele with gliosis, and there's, uh, again, it's lateral uh, permeation in the lateral recess. So here's a summary slide of some MRI interpretation pitfalls, some of which I've touched on. Technical factors such as asymmetric head position in homogeneous signal and partial volume effects can be a problem, particularly for the hippocampus and generally high resolution imaging is better. Epilepsy really challenges us to take our time with cases and to be some systematic in our approach. Um, and there are some structural variations and benign features to be aware of. And I just wanted to mention another thing we published on which is that developmental venous anomalies can be hypometabolic on PET, which could mimic a patient. But of course, you should also look at pathognomics assisted DPAs. Finally, in terms of future directions for epilepsy imaging, I think we're seeing more and more in our own research group and in the literature attempts to combine structural imaging, functional imaging, and clinical data with brain connectivity analysis and artificial intelligence to try to identify lesions, lateralize or localize the seizure onset zone, dialectic placement for intracranial EEG for neuromodulation, and predict the success of surgery for neuromodulation strategies. And I'm really excited to see where this leads. So again, I just want to lead you, leave you with that take-home message in closing. Uh, we can mandate as imagers and imaging scientists to find lesions and change and save lives for epilepsy patients. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>